Good morning, everybody. Lightly on the clock, clock, clock. We're getting to just a little late start with art, but I don't think that's a risky deal. Uh, it's nice to have a little bit of social time. We haven't seen people for a month. Um, welcome to the club. Uh, we are, uh, uh, let's see, we've got one more monthly meeting before we start some summer programs with uh, Golden Spike coming up in May. Uh, we want, we want people to decide it and come and go to the spike. Um, um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I guess we two days. Well, part, of it, part of it depends on this meeting. Okay. So it's let me meeting. ask the giant question. How many of you will support the Golden Spike event this, this year? It's, uh, it'll, there, the two days that we're thinking of, uh, the actual day of the event is May 10th. Wednesday. Which is a Wednesday, and we're also looking at the Saturday before. So it'll be two, it could be two days. I think it should be the 9th and the 10th. Usually we've done that. Um, the, for a lot of people, the problem becomes that it's... Tuesday and Wednesday, and they've got jobs and other things. So we were trying to look for a way to include people to come up and, and operate like on Saturday when they have free time, and then again on the day of if they can get away and do that. The, the other reason that it's the Saturday and the Wednesday is because the Forest Service is planning events for Saturday and Wednesday, but not Monday and Tuesday. So that's why it's the Saturday and the Wednesday. So I don't worry particularly about Saturday, but how many of you would be willing to come up on the Wednesday? Willing and able, not the same thing. Uh, does it, do, to me, there's no distinction. You're either there or you're not there. So how many of you would be willing to be up there on the Wednesday? So, okay, we're going to go with Saturday and Wednesday. Now, the Bridgerland Club has been invited, and they are planning on coming. And right now, I'm thinking we're going to have them. They're actually going to bring their trailer. They'll probably, they're going to set up, uh, and I've talked to them about doing the UHF VHF <laughs> station, because we are going to do UHF VHF station. We are planning on having POTA activation, right? Yes, okay. POTA activation as well. Uh, the club call is, or the, uh, the special events call has been secured. And um, so we're... Um, I don't for, for which one? For um, Golden Spike. So Golden Spike is W7G. And uh, I believe Val picked that up for us again this year. And... Uh, um, then we'll, you wanted, did you sign up with POTA? Has that been arranged? Uh, no, I have not signed up for POTA yet. Uh, it looks, the way it looks, we'll be using the W7G call sign for POTA. Right. But I think we have to register as a club with our club call sign. Okay. That's the way I understand we it. We can so do far. that. Whatever it takes. <laughs> We can do that, okay? So, no problem. If they want a POTA, we can use W7SU. If Golden Spike, we are, we can use both. So, whatever it takes. It's my understanding we can use both. But uh, if okay. we're calling with W7G, that's what we'll use for a POTA. Okay. But I understand we have to submit it as a club. Okay, and that, and that that's fine. Like I say, you you own that. So you, so the way the way that I'm going to do this and I'm going to do uh, field day this year is I'm going to assign different people to own small pieces of the event, and uh, he stepped up to uh, Gary stepped up to go ahead and uh, own that poda piece of our event. So anyhow, so. Uh, and right now, uh, I'm planning on being on the air by 10 a.m. I know it's a long drive up from Ogden, 
So that's why I'm, I'm kind of targeting 10 a.m. rather than 9 a.m. We'll operate until about 5, which is when the park shuts down. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll do basically the same thing on the Wednesday. And the, the park has thing activities on both the Saturday and the Wednesday. Where is this event? This will be at the Golden Spike Monument. Uh, you go up Interstate 15, get off uh, like you're going to Corinne, there at Newcore Steel, head toward Corinne, just follow that road until you almost get to what used to be known as Thiokol. You'll see the sign for the Golden Spike Turnoff, Golden Spike Monument. Follow that road over, and uh, there you go. You'll be right there. Um, I guess they just installed a huge solar panel farm right out there. So Yeah, there, yeah, there is one. Uh, some of us are going to go spend uh, 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 Friday night at the Spiral Jetty. So we'll go out there. We might operate from out there. We might just sit around the campfire and cook marshmallows. Weather dependent, of course. If it's snowing, Justin, you can go, but I'll probably not go if it's snowing. <laughs> I'm on the fence. So, anyhow, so that's kind of the plan. Yeah, for those who haven't been exposed to it before, is this setting up a special event station? Is it setting up something that the public are going to come and ask yes. about? Yes. Okay, so the special event station, uh, what we do is we go up there and we help uh, the, the park there celebrate the um, anniversary of the driving of the Gold Spring. And they have uh, all kinds of programs, they have all kinds of things going on, they have demonstrations, they bring out the trains. And the whole time we're out there just making contacts on, the, on a couple of different frequencies. And we set up our little table, we have our banners, and when people walk by, they ask questions, you know, what are you doing? We explain to them, we've had people come from all over, ham radio operators that haven't operated forever that want to try it out again. Uh, we let people operate. Um, you know, we, we, we had a couple of kids, there was what, a half a dozen kids we had show up, and they all got to operate, and a couple of them made contacts and things like that. So it is a, a more, uh, you know, public event, um, hands-on, that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, there are a lot of amateurs across the country who wait for us to come up with that special event. And when you're operating, you find that a lot of them say, well, I've been waiting for you to get on the air. I want to log you. So. Yeah, yeah, we, we uh, and, and uh, Pete takes care of all of our uh, QSL cards, and we do send them all out to every contact we make. And we have a special card for it. It's uh, if you look at w7g.org, is that right? That's right. W7g.org. It takes you right to our website on that web page for the special event. You can see the cards that we've used in the past. You can see the cards that we'll be using this year. Um, We're also set up on QRZ as well, and there will be an announcement in QST. And yeah, we we do the announcement in QST. We set stuff up on QRZ. Uh, this year we're going to try POTA. We haven't done that in a few years. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Gene said, we've invited the other club, to, another club, to come down and operate with us. So it should be a, a, a pretty interesting event. It's a lot of fun. If you come out, you can use the radio as much or as little as you like. Um, it's a great opportunity. Plus, if you have kids or grandkids, taking them down to those trains and having them participate in some of those activities and things. It's a lot of fun. Uh, done that for years, but now my youngest is 18. The only thing he wants to do is play video games and hang out with his friends. So probably won't be dragging him down there anytime soon. I keep trying to get him to get his license. That's like pulling alligator teeth. The bands. You mentioned VHF. You can do, so that's VHF, UHF. You can do bunch of HF frequencies? Or? Yeah, we, we usually are uh, centered around 40 and 20. I don't remember the exact frequencies, but uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, frequencies that we set up on our announcements, right, Val? That's right. And, uh, and we try to stick around those frequencies, but uh, every once in a while we'll run into someone's net and we'll have to move frequencies a little bit, or the band is not really working too well in that specific area and we, we move around a little bit. But people, uh, you know, they, they listen for us, they kind of scan around, so we try to, to stick right about where we tell them that we're going to be. The Golden Spike Box Elder 
uh, club is planning on bringing their trailer, and that will be VHF. Yep, so we're, we are going to add that this year as well. Um, VHF contacting from up there is a little more challenging. Uh, you, you only have a couple of repeaters that you can actually see. And our repeaters aren't visible until you either, uh, you got to go up about 30 feet. No, you, you can get to Mount Ogden from there if you got the, the right <laughs> antenna. Like I said, you got to go up about 30 feet. Or no, you don't got to go up 30 feet. <laughs> I can get it from my truck. I, I had a hard time with that. Promontory. What's that? You can also probably hit promontory. Yes, you can hit promontory from out there. The, you've got the thigh call repeaters, but they're all linked together through the bridge relay. Well, you know that. But, uh, so go ahead. Will they be trying to do uh, simplex on VHF? I don't know. I would imagine well, they would. Why not? Well, uh, 146 foot. If, they, if they're going to do CODA, it can't be done over a land based repeater. Right. Right. So, so I would imagine that they will be doing some 146.52 uh, contacts as well. So um, anyhow, so we, we have a little more coordination to do with them. So we just wanted to make sure there was interest on their side. It looks like there is. So uh, we'll be getting with them and kind of making sure that we've got everything worked out. No details yet on Bridgerland, but they showed an interest on the net the other night. Okay. So we should have uh, we should have a little more support from from them as well. Uh, also, keep your eye on the website because a lot of information will be out there uh, for all these different events and what might change, the details, that kind of stuff. Um, we also have after that is June, and then we have our uh, uh, field day operations, and uh, we're set up for the same location that we've been set up for for a few years. Uh, over there, at, um, it's uh, Marriott. Marriott Park, just off of 12th Street, just across from uh, the IRS there. Nice little park. Um, that'll be in June, and then July we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have our uh, uh, our tea hunt. So the transmitter hunt will be in July. Uh, August is our steak fry. And uh, then we slowly work our way back around to meeting again as a as a club in these kind of meetings. Um, so keep because we won't be having uh, the only the last meeting that we have as a club like this uh, is going to be next month. We have a little bit of an issue with that. We've lost this space for next month. So they moved their prom date to the day that we're supposed to be meeting, and they told us that they don't want us in the building because they're going to be setting up for prom. So we are figuring things out. We, we, may, uh, we may go over to the park. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we may go over to the park just around the corner. Um, if we do that, then uh, we'll just let everybody know. It'll be out on the website. We'll put notes on the doors, that kind of stuff. Um, we're looking at maybe doing a demonstration on something. It could be something setting up a, a portable station. Um, we can show some uh, mobile operation uh, that we have, like uh, several of us have a lot of radios in our trucks, things like that. We'll figure something out. We'll put it out there on the website. Um, but don't be discouraged. It's not that we won't have a meeting. We will have a meeting. It's just going to be at a different location for, for next time. Can I make a quick announcement? Sure. I want to say something that I thought was totally stupid. It couldn't be done. How many here have done 10 meters? Raise your hands. <laughs> you know, when Gene, when Gene announced this certificate you get for making 10 contacts on 10 meters 100 miles away, because the conditions have been so bad in the past, I just said it ain't going to happen. But a week ago, I was at work, and my fellow co-worker, who's in camp, said, Hey, now 10 meters is open. You ought to try it. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try. But I didn't have very much of a positive attitude about it. And just so you know, in the last two weeks, I've worked 10 different international countries on 10 meters. And every day, I listen, and I can hear people all over the world on 10 meters. So if you haven't taken Gene's challenge, to get your 10 on 10 contact, 
list. It's 100 miles away. Do it. It's a lot of work and it's fun. I really enjoyed it. And I do want to make one other final announcement. If you're, if you're a member of the... I turned off the... Everybody can hear me. If you're, not, if you're a member of the VHF Society and haven't got your booklet yet, please come and see me after the meeting because I want to distribute them so I don't have to mail them to you. And if you're not a member, I encourage you to consider joining. We sure could use your support. Our dues are going up to $20 a year at the end of this month. But if you pay now, if you want to pay for one year or more, it's $17 still till the end of the month. So come and see me after the meeting if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, we, we recommend that you become a member of the Utah VHF Society. Uh, it's not required or anything, but it is a good idea. They are the ones that set up and maintain a lot of repeaters that are in the area. Um, it wasn't that long ago that they helped us purchase uh, the repeaters that we're using currently. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great way to help support the ham radio operations in Utah. Um, let's see, is there anything else for the club? I don't think so. Gene's got, um, got our presentation today, and I completely forgot what it's about. Uh, watering elephants. <laughs> okay, that should be interesting. <laughs> it's about logging. <laughs> oh, logging. Okay, that's that's one. Of, so there was um, uh, we did one of the uh, ham and egg nets. Uh, I don't know. It was a couple few years ago. I asked the question, "What is it that the club wants to hear about in meetings like this?" And there was a list. There is a whole list. And this is one of them that was mentioned by several people. They want to know about logging, how to do logging, the different types of logging, uh, that kind of stuff. How to. Um, when you do the 10 on 10 or any of the other contests, they require confirmation of your contact. And the best way to do that is through a logging system. Uh, QRZ has a logging system. Um, are you going to go over the, what's the one from the ARRL, that complicated log book of the world? Log book of the world. There's a bunch of different ones, and they all have different requirements, and they all do different things a little bit. Uh, but the idea is so that you can confirm your contact, so you can turn in your information to whatever contest you're working, and they can send you a certificate, or in this case, we'll bring it to you here at a club meeting or one of our other things. So um, this will be useful. Okay. Can we get the lights? Uh, I want to go back to Golden Spike event, just FYI. Uh, for those of you that have never gone to that event, there's plenty of parking. Um, we will set up underneath the pavilion, so we're outside, but we're not um, under the sky. We are under the pavilion. Uh, we will set up uh, a vertical antenna, uh, the club's vertical antenna, and that's what we'll run. And then we'll have the club's radios there, and then, like Evan mentioned, we're going to have the Bridgerland people there with the UHF. VHF um, station, so we'll be running HF, UHF, VHF. So, yeah, so that's the rundown on uh, the Golden Spike event. So, hope to see you all there. So, let's jump right into our presentation. Is that down enough for you? Is what down? The lights. I I think so. Yeah. I don't want every I don't want anybody going to sleep. So if you're down too far, I'll I'll start hearing snoring. Especially in my presentations. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I saw somebody raise their hand with a question. Okay, maybe not. All right, good. So anyhow, uh, we're going to talk about logging. Now, for some of you older hands, you're kind of going, logging? What that? And for some of the newer hands, they're going to probably be kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. So we're going we're gonna to start from the very beginning and work our way. Okay, here we go. Uh, agenda, a brief history of logging. Uh, why do we log QSOs? Electronic logging, log book of the world, QRZ, and then questions. So that's the, that's the agenda. So we will get to 
electronic logging as we get to the end of the presentation. Um, but I feel like we, it's good to always lay a foundation. Why are we even talking about this? Why is it important enough for us to take up a meeting to talk about logging? Um, it's been a fundamental part of ham radio for, from the very beginning. As near as I've been able to determine, we started, ham started uh, exchanging QSL cards when the very first hams started to exchange signals um, and send signals out across um, the ocean and stuff. So this is not new. Um, why did they log? Well, there's probably as many reasons for logging as there are people that were logging. Biggest reason was they wanted to keep track of where their signals were going. Remember, as hams, we were really into experimenting, and every time we'd make a change or build something or fiddle with an antenna, we wanted to understand kind of did it help or did it hurt? And that was part of what logging was all about. You put up a new antenna and, well, all of a sudden I'm able to get out 800 miles instead of 300 miles. So that was part of the reason for it. Then, uh, you know, the AM broadcast uh, started to get commercialized and the shortwave listener crowd started to send in uh, logging um, requests or QSL requests and here's a QSL card from WWV um, sent in the 1940s so um, so it's so it's been around for a long time and logging and QSL cards kind of go hand in hand with each other so that's why I kind of use those two together so let me uh, i got a lot of speaker notes here, so I have to kind of keep just a couple of interesting points. Uh, the first radio signal uh, that was purposely sent occurred in the summer of 1865 by a dentist named Mon Loomis, who sent a signal uh, up a wire suspended by a kite to a similar arrangement that was 18 miles away. So that was one of the first recorded uses of radio. And by the way, my reference on that is from a book called 200 Meters Down by Clinton DeSoto, page 11. So anyhow, any, uh, so moving on, so uh, in 1914, Hiram Percy Maxim formed the ARRL. And uh, of course you all know that's the organization that supports, promotes, and lobbies for the ham radio community. So, very important organization. Um, and so, in 1935, um, they decided that it would be a really good idea to start giving away awards for different accomplishments. Two in particular that I think most of us are familiar with are Worked All States and DXCC. So DXCC is a, you work a hundred countries. There were a number of other awards that were available. I think there was a Worked All Continents and uh, Working All of South America, a whole bunch of different ones. But all of those required that you had to confirm the QSO. So anyhow, so the question that sometimes comes up is, well, why do we log today? Because the FCC basically did away with the requirement for logging back in 1982. We no longer had to log our, our contacts. Uh, so why do we do it today? Well, I thought about that. I thought, well, old habits die hard. That's one of the reasons I log. So old habits just because, why not, goes back to the spirit of uh, experimentation, seeing where your signal has gone. And then the other big one is award chasing, and that's probably a big one. Hams love to chase awards. It's like a ham radio version of bingo, I think. You know, so you fill in a little card with all the states that you work, or all the countries that you work, or all the counties that you work. I mean, there's just all kinds of awards. 
Well, in order to qualify for any of those awards, those QSOs need to be confirmed. So let's talk about what does that mean. What that means is that a QSO requires that both stations acknowledge that QSO. And that information associated with that QSO, here are the, the, the four things that have to match up. Call signs. The date and time of the QSO, plus or minus 30 minutes, okay? So if your clock's off a couple of minutes, no big deal. As long as that QSO, as long as the time you recorded um, is within 30, plus or minus 30 minutes. And it needs to be in GMT. That way, if you're talking to someone, because the GMT is the same whether you're sitting in England or sitting in Utah. So always record your QSO times in GMT. Go ahead, is Justin. Is QSO start time or end? Because if I'm doing CW, it's like 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, it's, that's a good question. And the answer to that question is it doesn't matter. As long as the times that you entered for that QSO agree within 30 minutes. Because I've had QRZ where I filled out and I was like, well, let's see, we started at this time, but we ended at this time. Right. And, and QRZ says, nope, <laughs> nope, nice try, nope. And you fill out all the data again and you bump it up 15 minutes and it says, nope. <laughs> I, I always just put in the... the some time uh, when I go to log the QSO while I'm talking to that station, I'll write down the time that it is. And I've never had one rejected. Like I said, QRZ says it has to be plus or minus 30 minutes. Logbook of the World has the same rules. So now the other thing you've got to be aware of is, you know, later in the day, you know, it might be, you know, March 12th here. But GMT, it might be March 13th. Right. So you have to also be aware of that as well. So, yeah. So, anyhow, I keep a GMT clock on my watch here, so I always know what the date and time is. Go ahead. Okay, I'm, with, with the question that he had, I'm thinking if he enters the start time and the person he's having the QSO with enters their end time, so you've got like a 45 minute gap, maybe it would be better to enter like the time right in the middle because then you've got some leeway on either side. You know, and I would say that if that ever comes up, the station you're talking to, ask them. Say, hey, let, what time do you, do you want to log this? If if that ever, because it's so rarely rare that you'll talk to someone for that long where it's going to matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it happens, but it's pretty rare that it happens. I, like I said, I usually write down the time around the start of the queue, so I don't worry about the end of the queue. So, so uh, that's that's gen, been my, and I've never had one rejected. So, anyhow, uh, the band now on my QSL card, I just write the frequency in because from the frequency you can determine the band. I mean, that's a that's a no-brainer. And then, of course, the mode. Uh, single sideband, FTA. Go ahead, Mel. I was just going to ask a quick question about the band. Yeah. I've noticed some of the DX content I make, you know, I'll put the frequency on my card, but when I get the card from them, they just put, like, 28 megahertz. Right. And that's still acceptable. Yes, because all that matters is the bands match. So if you put 28 megahertz in and they put 10 meters, you're good. You're gold. So, but if you, I've never seen anybody work a split across bands. I guess it's possible where you're on 40 and they're on 20, but that might be a problem. Um, but yeah, it's usually, like I say, it's, it's about the, the, the band. And I record the frequency um, just, you know, and from that it's easy to discern the band. So, and then of course, uh, there's the mode. So FTA, FT4, single sideband. Now I've seen people use LSB and USB and that's fine. Everybody understands, including a lot of the, algorith the algorithms they use for matching QSOs, understands that LSB and USB is also SSB. So that's the main thing. So if you're mobile and you're talking to somebody mobile on HF, and you want to you want to log that call. These are the four things that you need to write down: call sign, date and time of the call, 
the band that you were on, and the mode you were working. Jot just those four things down, then when you get home, you can log it. Go on to, you know, bring up your logging program or whatever you want to use. So, okay, let's keep moving. Um, so, now that we have, and I'm kind of jumping a little bit, I couldn't figure out where the best place to put this slide, but I figured one of the questions that would come up is because we no longer need to log anymore, uh, and because there's so much electronic logging going on, do we still really, I mean, do people still really send out QSL cards? Yeah. The answer to the question is, yeah, they do. Don't get a lot of them anymore, nothing like we used to, but yeah, I still get QSL cards in the mail. And on my QRZ site, if you were to go to my QRZ site, the first paragraph, I talk specifically about that. And I tell people that I love getting QSL cards, and if you send me a QSL card, I will send you one back. This is just a sample of some of the QSL cards that I've received uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, interesting one here, you can't see all the way, this one here. This is from Jonestown. You remember the People's Temple, Jonestown? That's where that card was from. So, yeah. <laughs> and Albert Toschetti. So, anyhow, let's keep going. And along came the computer. <laughs> so, here you see the MSI 1975 Val. Do you still have yours? Yes, I do. All right. <laughs> How often do you get offers for it? Haven't tried. One of the very first club meetings that I went to was a presentation on the MSI computer. And you have to understand, the MSI, there's no keyboard, there's no monitor. The only input was these switches in the front. That's how you programmed it. Now later, of course, people figured out how to add peripherals to it because it had an expandable bus, an S100 bus, if I remember right. And it was expandable, and so people started to add um, CRTs and keyboards and tape, paper tape readers and all kinds of stuff. Then IBM introduced the IBM PC 1975, I remember that. Commodore PET. Uh, they came out with, they actually had three different models, but 1977, uh, Apple II came out in 1977. The TRS Model 1, 19, 1977 was a big year. That also is the year I got licensed. June, my first QSO was in June of 1977. I was six years old. <laughs> and then Commodore, the VIC-20, first computer I ever owned and then the Commodore 64. So, now, uh, here is, so one of the things that was really popular when these uh, computers started coming, in, coming into the market was the ham radio magazines, QST73 and CQ Magazine, which I subscribed to all three of those back then. Um, they would send out what they called type-ins. And you could actually type in there would be a program listing, generally always in some version of BASIC, uh, which was actually at the end of the day were all Microsoft BASIC, the BASIC that Bill Gates wrote initially for the MSI, believe it or not. Fascinating story around that that I won't go into here, but it's from the book. If you're ever interested, uh, there's a book by Robert X. Cringely called Accidental Empires, and they talk about that quite a bit. There's also... Uh, uh, a documentary called Revenge of the Nerds where they talk a little bit about what happened. So, um, but anyhow, here is a sample of a uh, type-in program that does logging from 1981. I actually own this book and I actually typed that computer program in, but I converted it to my Commodore computer. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And there would be type-ins for all kinds of things. Ready uh, programs and uh, and all, yeah, just all sorts of stuff. Even yours truly published uh, two magazine articles 
back in 1984. One was for the VIC-20. It was for learning how to uh, send and receive Morse code. And the other one was called Put the DX World on the Screen, which was a program where you could go in and you could type in a prefix and it would come back and tell you uh, the, uh, what country it was, the bearing and distance from where you were, and give you a MUF graph for that country. Um, so that was, that was something I did clear back uh, then. So those were, lots happened since then. But anyhow, just, uh, and I still have copies of those two magazines. So later, uh, so as you can well imagine, here we are today, there are so many logging programs on the market today, I, I couldn't even begin to go through all of them, and I'm not going to. Um, there's really no, no need for it. But I can tell you what you should look for if you're looking for a logging program, which I would recommend that you do. Now, for some of you, your paper and, and pencil, that's fine. Problem is, is if you want to confirm you're kind of married to Q, QSL cards, you know, and there's some problems with QSL cards that we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But things to look for, can import and export an ADIF file, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Can import and export an ADIF file, can upload to Logbook of the World or QRZ, can talk to your radio via CAT uh, commands, uh, that stands for Computer Aided Transceiver, can access call books like QRZ, HAM, uh, QTH, DXX, DHMAPS, Ham call and call book. These are all online uh, programs that you can type in a call sign and it'll come back and give you the information for that call sign. Operator's name, where they're located, all kinds of stuff. If any of you ever used uh, like QRZ to look up a call sign, um, that's that's an example. And if you buy a logging program, you want you you want it to be able to to do that. Uh, to be and then the other thing is you want your logging program to be able to go talk to your radio so it can look at the frequency and the mode and all of that and automatically record that if you decide to log that QSO. Uh, very, very handy. And I've played around with uh, writing, writing programs that allowed me to control my radio. It's a lot of fun. It's not that hard. They're fairly... Now, I've never done one for ICON. All of the ones I've done are for Yesu. Um, the hardest ones were for the early Yesus, like the FT-1000. Uh, the FT-847 is, is pretty, uh, pretty archaic as well as far as the cat language. But for like the newer rigs, they, you know, the 991, the 5000, the 2000, the 3000, they're all fairly easy to write code for. So uh, anyhow, so just FYI on that. But those are the things you want to look for in a logging program. And if you go to this URL, I know it's hard to see, there's a whole list of them. Now, the most popular ones, um, I think you'll find the market share um, Ham Radio Deluxe um, is probably one of the most popular ones. There was, there's an old free version, but it, it's, uh, you have to buy that one. Uh, Logbook for Old Men, uh, that's a free one. I initially started out with that one, and it worked fairly well. It did all of that stuff, um, and, and I liked it a lot. And then there are, um, let's see, oh, and then there's contest logging software like N1MM and N3FJP, which is what we use, right, for field day. Uh, and I understand that N1 F, uh, FJP, that can be adapted to do just normal day-to-day -day kind of uh, logging, you know, where you're rag chewing or you're FT-18 or, or whatever. Where uh, Ham Radio Deluxe and Logbook for Old Men, those are more uh, for just kind of general, general use. The other one not mentioned here is Logbook of the World, or excuse me, QRZ, it can actually be used as a logging program. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, as the internet began to come, become ubiquitous, uh, someone decided it might be a great way of confirming QSOs. Actually, it was. 
it eliminated the cost of sending out paper QSLs. So you had postage, which to some foreign countries could be a few bucks. It eliminated the cost of the printing the QSL cards, which they're not expensive. I, I think 500 of them, I think, cost me about $100, um, you know, a couple years ago. So they, they weren't that expensive. The other thing is mail did not work equally well around the world. So imagine trying to get a QSL card from Uganda. You know, that's kind of what you were up in, or Mongolia. Uh, and the mail was slow, especially to certain parts of the world. So I remember waiting uh, months to get a QSL card back from some of the countries that I had worked. Fun fact, QRZ came online in October of 1993. Logbook of the World came online in September of 2003. By the way, in the presentation, I have the specific references for these, these dates. So I, everything I'm telling you, I try to validate and I provide the references uh, for them. Uh, what's an ADIF file? Now we talked about that earlier. So, so we've talked about the history of logging in QSL, why we do it, and we've talked about the impact of computers and how we started to see computers take over that job of doing that logging. Um, and we've talked about the importance of confirmation in order to qualify for awards. But underneath all that magic is, well, how does that work exactly? How do I get the data from my logging program, logbook, of, or uh, let's say Ham Radio Deluxe or Logbook for Old Men, how do I get that up to QRZ or get that up to uh, Logbook of the World? Well, it's through the magic of what we call ADIF, Amateur Data Interchange Format. All that is is an agreed to standard of what that file structure is going to look like. And I'll show you an example of it. This is an excerpt from an ADIF file. My one, This particular file's got, I don't know, a couple thousand uh, QSOs in it. But you can kind of see what the, this is. Uh, this is a screenshot that came out of uh, a regular text editor. In this case, it was uh, Microsoft Notebook. It's just a text editor is all it is. And you can see kind of how things are structured here. So you have a label, then you have the length of the data, and then the data. So if this was uh, only a four-digit call sign, instead of a six, that would be a four. The, the thing that makes this possible to, to exchange data with different systems is the ADIF standard says that call, we will use that label call to identify the call sign of the station. We'll use this label for grid square, this label for FTA, for mode, and so on. And there are hundreds of labels but they're all the agreed to standard. So, uh, and, that, and that's basically how it works. And in the, in the uh, presentation, there's a link to where you can go see the ADIF standard. So, I know that's, we're getting a little geeky there because we're kind of getting under the covers down where people don't um, typically need to go, but I wanted to explain how that works. So. You know, I can take my, my uh, logbook on my hard drive, whether it's Ham Radio Deluxe or Logbook for the Old World, for Old Men or, or whatever, have it spit out an ADIF file, and then I can upload that ADIF file to Logbook of the World or to QRZ. And we're actually going to look at how to do that here in a few minutes. But I kind of wanted to give, give you some insights of what's going on underneath the covers a, a little bit. So now we're going to talk about logbook of the world. Pros and cons of logbook of the world. Now, as you all know, logbook of the world is an ARRL product, I guess. I don't know what the right. It's free, which is one of the advantages of it. Um, doesn't cost you anything. You just go create a, 
uh, a logbook of the world account, and that's it. Um, it uses digitally signed certificates, military grade security. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it really hard to set up is that military grade security because you have to install a piece of software on your uh, hard drive called Trusted QSL. We'll, we'll get a little more into that. Uh, the cons is it's got a pretty cryptic user interface. It's an interface that a SQL uh, programmer would probably just love. But, you know, Joe Schmo, average guy, doesn't, you know, yeah, it's usable, but like I said, I don't think it was ever intended to be used as a log book. What it is, is it's a QSO data repository with a really powerful system that allows it to match up QSOs. That's what it does. The other advantage of the ARRL, the log book of the world, is the ARRL will recognize QSOs confirmed through log book of the world as being eligible for ARRL awards, okay? Logbook of the World does not recognize uh, QSOs that are confirmed by QRZ. So, for example, let's say Justin and I had a QSO. Justin uploads his log to Logbook of the World. I upload my logbook to QRZ. QRZ does, isn't taught... I, I could, you know, my QRZ isn't set up to talk to Logbook of the World. That QSO would go forever unconfirmed. But if I uploaded my QSO to Logbook of the World as well, then it would be confirmed and recognized by the ARL as a legitimate QSO. So understand that. And there'll be, there's some implications to that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, hard to set up? Yeah, you can't just sit down, set it up, and you're ready to go. Uh, you have to wait to get a postcard back from the ARL with your certificate uh, password. Um, single purpose, all it does is uh, it's this database of QSOs. That's pretty much all it is. Uh, requires installation of software on your local hard drive. So. Um, it's not a big deal. It's a fairly simple piece of software, but it does require you to put that software on there. Okay. Gene? Yes. I would make a suggestion because I, I got on from Logbooks of the World a few years ago, and what made it easy for me was I found somebody else who had done all the work before, and I said, would you come and help me because this is like foreign language. And it works. We're going to talk about that very topic in a minute. I got a slide on that. I so that two years ago, Mel, I had the same thing. I had a good helper and yeah. get through it. Question? Go ahead. Question. How, how does the world handle duplicates? Handle what? Duplicates. How does it handle duplicates? So let's clarify. I, I started using it back in like 2008 to uh -huh. launch some satellite QSOs. Yeah. That I had been entering manually the spreadsheets, uh -huh. so I was I was manually entering them into plug with the world, which was horrible. Right. Mm -hmm. And then later on, uh, I think I got them entered into QRZ. Okay. And I did it, the ADF file and uploaded it to oh. Book of the World, and it really messed things up. Okay, that's a really good question. I'm going to restate the question: How does Logbook of the World handle duplicates? In other words. Uh, Let's say that I uploaded a QSO to Logbook of the World in July. And I come along later in like, I don't know, a year later, and I upload that same QSO again to Logbook of the World. Logbook of the World looks at it, compares it to the record it has, and says, oh, no changes, so we're good. It's fine. It throws it out. It kicks it out. No problem. What it's looking for, though, is let's say that that call was unconfirmed, but since then you had gotten a QSL card from that guy, and you had marked it as having received a QSL card, and then you uploaded that once, you uploaded that QSL again, but this time that one bit of data had changed, Logbook of the World would pick that up and say, oh, he got a paper QSL, here's the date, this is now a confirmed QSL. 
So it, it handles it very elegantly. Okay. QRZ does the same thing. Yes, sir. Well, just about one thing. In the past, we used to have to go to a QSL card checker to get a confirmed right. deal for ARL. If you just check the box and say, I've got a card, does LOTW just automatically say that's confirmed? It, it, it looked that way to me, but I've only had a couple, done that a couple of times. So I want to go ahead. I've done that probably four or five times. One of the problems you have with digital FTA communications is the conflict between the old and the new. You have some people who do only QSL cards, and you have some people that do only specific, well, especially international. Um, and those had, are not? Yeah, I've had four cards, like uh, Route 66 in California, the club that does that. It took me forever and a day, but you have to have dual confirmation. Okay. If you do just yours, it's not going to be considered Because I've had a couple, I'd swear it confirmed, and, uh, but... If you can convince them to confirm it, then yes. So noted. <laughs> so, here is an example of the user interface for Logbook of the World. What I had to do is go in and fill out this information basically saying uh, I would like all the QSOs for 2023 and it printed out this list and of course I can download that list but that's how cryptic Logbook of the World is so like I said as a logging program Logbook of the World is not the right answer but for a QSO database it's awesome and like I said it, it uh, yeah, so enough said on that. Here is uh, data for a specific QSO uh, as Logbook of the World would display it. In a minute, you'll see QRZ, how they display QSO data uh, for a particular QSO. But this is what uh, Logbook of the World, again, just emphasizing the point, it was really never meant to be a logging program per se. Oop. Setting up Logbook in the world, uh, it's fairly complicated, uh, far more complicated than can be explained in this meeting. So if you were hoping to see me walk through set up Logbook in the world, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You're not going to see that. There is a very good getting started uh, page at LOTW. If you will read that before you type a single key, it'll save you a lot of trouble. The other thing, um, there's also some good videos on YouTube, so go check those out. But here's the biggest thing. Write down any password you are instructed to create and define what they are for. There will be a password for your online Logbook of the World account. So when you go to Logbook of the World and log into Logbook of the World, there's a password for that, which is different than your password for your Logbook. Okay? So, and that password will be sent to you on a postcard. So be aware of that. Understand the difference. Um, and that postcard will arrive by mail. Save it. That was one of the biggest problems that I, when I was helping people get on Lockbook of the World, they say, oh, I got that postcard, but I don't know what I did with it. And it's like, well, it had your key to your, to your logbook on it, so you kind of need it. And to go through the process of getting it again is a little bit of a pain in the behind. So, anyhow, uh, here's a picture of that getting started guy. And this is where I was going to mention, uh, have someone come and help you who's uh, set up Logbook of the World before. Be patient. Recognize that it's not something you can do. You know, you can go and do part of it, then you wait, and then you can do the rest of it after you get that postcard. Where QRZ is a little different. So anyhow, this is a screenshot of that getting, that, uh, that getting help page. It, it, a lot of good information there. But don't attempt installing or doing Logbook of the World until you've gone through that. Okay, moving on. Uh, you do have to install something called TQSL, Trusted QSL, on your local hard drive. Here's... That's the Logbook of the World? Yes. 
Here is the um, number one bit of advice I'll give you. Create a folder somewhere on your hard disk and know where it is. Okay? Know where it is. Mel? I would go one step further. Copy that folder onto a thumb drive. I'll get to that. <laughs> Have you been looking at my presentation? <laughs> So what I did is in my documents folder, you know, whenever you log into Windows, there's a documents folder created for every user. I created a folder in there called LOTW-certs, and everything associated with TQSL is in there. So my certificate is in there, the backup, uh, a backup of the configuration, everything that I need is in that folder. And you do want to back that up to a thumb drive and throw it in your, your gun safe or put it in your cloud storage wherever you do your cloud storage. But have a backup of that folder, everything in that folder. You can reinstall T, uh, TQSL if something happens. As long as you've got that folder, you're gold. You do not have to go back through the process of getting another certificate. So that's why you want to make a backup of that folder. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up our discussion around logbook of the world. Now, um, the other thing I do want to say, I think I've already mentioned this, logbook of the world does not recognize confirmations from other entities such as QRZ. Okay, that's a big downside. Go ahead. I've not had any problem whatsoever between the two. Oh, you won't as long as you set things up correctly. They talk to each other just fine. Just fine. No problem. In fact, we're going to go through that in this presentation. So, yes? I know some of the uh, logging programs, you can actually put your logbook of the world thing, your information, whatever, in. And it's supposed, I don't know how that all works or what that all I, I will cover that. <laughs> I got it all covered. This tells me that I, I had, I, I knew what you guys were going to ask. So it's like because I tried to put a slide in. Although there's one question that has not come up today that I'm a little bit surprised has not come up. But I even put a slide in here, but I wasn't going to show it unless the question come up. That was on Cabrillo. So anyhow, let's talk about QRZ. Um, Pros and cons of QRZ, it's easy in my opinion, far easier to set up than Logbook of the World. Amen. It takes you about three minutes to go in and create a logbook in QRZ. And there's, yeah, it's just really easy. Uh, there's an extensive support network if you need help. So there's an online forum that's got so much information in it that it'd take you days to read it all if you needed to, uh, has a lot more to offer than just electronic logging. It can actually be used as a real live logging program. Now I use QRZ, Now I want to be careful here. A lot of times we ham radios will um, show our bias. Uh, and sometimes people will think that we have a bias even though we really don't. Like G5 RVs. People think I hate G5 RVs, which I don't. What I hate is when G5 RVs are not installed properly. That's what I don't like. Otherwise, G5 RVs are awesome antennas. But I use QRZ. I love it. I looked at a lot of different programs before I went to QRZ. And I just like the simplicity of having one program to work with. And it was in the cloud, so I didn't have to worry if my computer died or whatever. And it was highly useful. And so I said, and it, only, it does cost me $36 a, a year. Um, so I like it. I use it. That's what we're going to talk about. But like I said, I want to be careful. It's not the only thing out there. It just it works great for me, and I like it. So, but it has a lot of other functionalities that I that I like. But anyhow, um, no waiting. You can have your logbook up in minutes. Uh, it integrates with Logbook of the World, uh, no problem. It can also integrate with a lot of uh, client-based uh, logging programs like uh, 
ham radio deluxe and some others. Um, cons, some features require a $36 a year subscription fee. The XML download feature is one of those that requires that subscription fee. Um, they, they also have the uh, connection for Logbook of the World, but you have to subscribe to that too. Yes. Yes. Um, and then and the, down, the cons is confirmations that are not recognized by the ARRL. So if you have a QSA that was only confirmed in QRZ, you can't use it to apply for an award from ARRL. So, for example, uh, I think in QRZ I've confirmed like 75 countries, but in Logbook of the World I've only confirmed, I think, 65. So I don't have my DXCC yet. So, but that's okay. Logbook of the World also has a whole lot of other awards as well. Stuff I'd never even heard of, like the Friendship Award. What's that about? You know, I, they're just gaz gazillion of them. Here's a copy of uh, the Logbook of the World, my logbook. Um, as you can see, it's way more useful than what you saw from... Uh, logbook of the world. Uh, it's got all these calls. Um, it's got, now, if you notice over here, it, I know it's hard to see, some of these don't have anything in it. That means they're unconfirmed. The light green background, though, what that means is they have been uploaded to QR, to logbook of the world. So anything that's got a light green background has, I have uploaded to Logbook of the World. If it's got a gold star in it, it's been confirmed by QRZ. Uh, if it's got a green circle around it, it's also been confirmed by Logbook of the World. Now, and Larry and I were talking about this the other day. What I found is if you will use both, you will have the best chance of confirming um, uh, for whatever you know award you're going for. Go ahead, Larry. Um, yeah, Gene, I just checked it yesterday. I have uh, 2,088 contacts as of yesterday, and 1,781 of them are confirmed. That's 85.3% by using both programs. Right. Or if you use just one or the other, that percentage, of course, will be a lot lower. Now, uh, the other thing to recognize about QRZ, it does recognize Logbook of the World confirmations. So if you have, if you've got them synced up, okay, so they talk to each other, if you have a, QS, a QSO that's confirmed only in Logbook of the World, QRZ will recognize it. So QRZ recognizes ARR confirmations. Um, so anyhow, that's, that's part of what the user interface looks like. Now here is QSO details. This is a uh, QSO that I logged with Northern Ireland and you can see there's a lot of good information here and if I want to go to this guy's QRZ page and look at his profile all I got to do is just click on that and it'll take me to his profile page and I can see what he's put in his profile page which I always find those are fascinating because you find out all kinds of things and whenever I go to a profile page and there's nothing there it's a little disappointing. So for those of you that have a QRZ account, I'd really recommend you go put something in there about you and your station because other people want to know. So anyhow, so there you go. There's a QRZ. But the other thing to notice on this screen is there's a lot of other stuff here. So there's, a, there's a resources here. Have, you, have any of you ever looked at what's under that resources tab? A lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Ditto over here under databases, news, forums. That's why I say it's a lot more than just a, a QSO database. Setting up QRZ, uh, if you plan to import or export your logbook or use a third-party logging program to look up calls, you will need to purchase a subscription. So in other words, if I'm using uh, Ham Radio Deluxe, and I want to populate my initial install of Ham Radio Deluxe with my QRZ logbook, 
uh, I, I, you can do that. But it does require you to buy that $36 subscription because that's what allows you to upload and download uh, log files is with that. If you're going to apply for the uh, Ogden Amateur Radio Club 10-meter work doll states, you will need to have that subscription because you need to send me your log. Okay? So I've been pretty, pretty flexible with the 10 on 10 stuff. So, um, but with log, but with worked all states award, I gotta have the log. Question? Gene, I don't pay that, and yet I can upload my log, my AD, ADIF files to. Oh, can you? Yeah. Can you download it though? You can't download that. You can't download it. No, you can't. Yeah. So, and that's why I say if if you apply for the 10 on 10, uh, the 10 meter work doll states, you need to have that subscription. Now you can download your log from Logbook of the World as well, but when you do that, you'd have to send me your entire logbook, the actual file, and you can filter it and whatever. So, um, anyhow, go ahead, Evan. Your previous screen, uh, I use that quite often in addition to the, uh, the summary screen. Uh, I screw it up. I, get working on, on 15 meters and then I decide I'm going to go to 10 meters and I got a whole bunch of them that or got the wrong band in it. And so I just go to the, uh, you know, double click on, on one of the columns and that screen comes up and I can make a correction on it. Right. I, use, I screw up quite often. The, the, use, the user interface is very intuitive. It's, it's as, I felt it was as good as any of the, the client-based logging programs that I had used. But again, I know that I'm probably showing my bias, and I apologize for that, but I'm just trying to tell you what my experience has been. <coughs> Go ahead, Elliot. I often put stuff on my laptop as well as desktop. Is having two installations of any of these logbook programs problematic? It's really one that with, with QRZ, it's not because it's cloud-based. What about Logbook but, of the World? But for the others, well, Logbook of the World is not in, well, with T, uh, Q, QSL, you would have to install TQSL on both computers. So, for example, on my it's desktop... It's installation, though. It doesn't require anything different. Though. No, it just requires you to... It requires two things. You have to install TQSL on whatever computers you're going to use. And then you have to uh, import import the certificate to the other computer. So my primary computer at home is where TQSL is at and where all the certificates are installed. But I also wanted to put it on this laptop. So I installed TQSL here and then was able to move that certificate over. Now, the certificate you're talking about is from Logbook of the World? Right. It's a security certificate. It's not the uh, system security certificate it's, your computers generate. No, it's, it, it's a public key, private key security certificate is what it is. So that's so why I say they use military-grade security for, like, a bunch of hams exchanging Q cells. Seems a little overkill to me. I mean, there won't be any financials losses. No one will die. Keeps the Chinese out of it. Yeah. It's so kind of like uh, PGP in some ways. It's yeah, but it's just it's just a way. But if you, you can have it on multiple computers, you just got to realize that there's a process to move those to copy those certificates over, and it's not just a simple drag and drop. There's a little more to it. Very simple, not hard, no problem, but it is a little bit more than drag and drop. What about the data? The data gets stored on their website, or do you store The data is stored in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about the, the data being... No, the data is stored in the cloud. That sounds bad. So there's, there's one other big benefit with uh, QRZ. They have different subscription levels. If you buy one, like I did this last year, that's a little bit higher subscription level, uh, Gene was saying he gets disappointed if someone goes to the, your QRZ site and there's nothing on it. They give you a certificate that you can turn in, and they'll go out and put content on your QRZ site. I believe you have to give them some pictures, stuff like that, whatever information, and they do it for So if, you, if you're really lazy, like I am, about doing things like that, you can actually hire someone else to do it for you. <laughs> 
Okay, and now... It also includes these other features, so you can download your logbook and other things like that for that same subscription. So. Now we're going to go through the process of setting up QRZ on your, uh, on your uh, local computer. It, it is pretty simple. I first began by uh, setting up account on QRZ, okay? That's pretty straightforward. You just go up there, buy a subscription if you want. And uh, to, set up a, to set up a logbook, you just go over here to where this tab, this has got my call sign. And I clicked on that. That brings up this drop down, and I selected my logbook. Okay? Super simple. Then this page comes up, and I select new logbook right here. That says new logbook. Really simple so far. Three mouse clicks. And then this screen comes up where I actually have to type in my call sign. Okay? Pretty simple. Now the hard part comes. You have to be able to fill out all this information. Logbook name, how hard is that? Start date of your first QSO, end date of your um, last QSO, uh, other users, so if you've got other people that use that same logbook, you would put their information in here. Uh, your QTH, your lat long and grid, CQ zone, which for Utah is three, ITU zone, which for Utah is six, and then there's some other questions which are all optional. Super simple, but know those answers to those questions before you go in. Um, and then I'm, let me talk about a couple of other things here. But you have a question, Mel, so go ahead. Unfortunately, I've had three different call signs. Does that cause a problem in the, any of these databases? Um, I don't know how Logbook of the World handles it. I. I apologize, it's not something I've never had to deal with. But I do know that QRZ considers call signs uniquely. So WB7RLX would be a different logbook than WB7RLX slash P. So in QRZ you'd create two different logbooks? Two different logbooks. So if I wanted to use QRZ, I could create a logbook for my old, old call sign, N5UVP. If it's active. Well, what if it's not active? You can't do anything. Well, how do I record all my contacts in the database? I don't know, because I tried that, because I previously had a previous call sign, a K7 OPI, uh -huh. and it won't let me interchange any of them. And, so you, you, and just, you can't even use the log unless it's an active call sign. Yeah. Pete. Pete ran into this. It was a big problem when he upgraded uh, from from his, and he changed call signs. Uh, it was a huge mess. I ended up writing an algorithm that allowed him to merge those two logs together, and then uploaded them to QRZ. Oh, really? I, had, I had to cheat at it, but yeah, we were able to do that. But How much do you charge for that service? To you? <laughs> Nothing. I don't charge people for any of my services. So a uh, couple of points. Uh, start date, of course. Now, what I did, I'll just relate my experience. So I used to live out in Roy. Uh, so, uh, and I had a big station out in Roy, and I was on the air for years. Hundreds of QSOs. So when I moved to my house up on Buchanan, <coughs> I went through all of my QSL cards, only my QSL cards, and I entered them into a spreadsheet, which I later converted into an ADIF file. Then I went up to QRZ and I created a logbook called Old. And I put the start date and end date for the first QSO and last QSO that I ever did from that QTH. And I uploaded that to QRZ. It's there to this day. I was surprised to actually see people confirm some of those contacts from clear back those, I mean, this clear back to 1977. So anyhow, and then I created a new logbook, which is the logbook I use today. And for the start date, I put in the 
the date of the first Q cell. For the end date, I actually, you can leave it blank, but I actually put in the expiration date of my license. And I operated like that for many years. Well, I had to renew my license, so what I did was I was able to go in and change that end date on my active log to the new end date that corresponded with my, uh, my uh, updated um, license. So that's what I did. So this end date, like I said, you can leave it blank if you don't know. But I think it's kind of handy to go ahead and put the end date of your, the expiration date of your license, because in that way you quickly know when your license is going to expire. So uh, lat long, a couple of words on that. So, um, and I think that, I think Stan asked a question about this a while back. Um, when when you when you go look at like the distance between me and Neil. Um, if, if I use just my four digit grid, put that in there and don't put lat long, the distance from me and Neil is wrong by a long ways. So what you want to do is when you set up your QRZ profile, you want to actually go in and put your actual lat long in your QRZ profile. Don't put your four-digit, well, you'll put your four-digit grid in there, but also put in your actual lat long. Go ahead. So <clears throat> my grid is actually where my address is, which is not at my house. You just have to, with the ARRL or the FCC, you have to have a valid mailing license, and that's for me, is up on Harrison. My house is just up the street here. So if I do the grid, the grid is for my address which puts me in the wrong place completely. Is it a four-digit grid or it's a six? Six-digit grid, but it's okay. still in the, in the wrong place. And if you want to put it exactly, go put in your actual lat long. Right, and so that's what I would do there. Um, however, the, the Maidenhead grid does go farther than six digits. Oh, yeah, it'll go but clear out to eight almost, as far as I know. Almost nobody supports that, so <laughs> they only support the six grid, which which is like a, a, a block or something. It's about that big. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, I made the mistake of not putting the lat long in, and uh, somebody made me aware that I was shown living somewhere down near Lehigh, so I uh, yeah. didn't fix that. The center point of DN41, which is where we are, is actually, I think, a little closer to Evanston, Wyoming than... So that's why you want to... So I recommend that you put your actual lat long in uh, when you set up your QRZ uh, page. Go ahead, Elliot. We have all this kind of software set up, what usually trips me out there is it wants a format different than I try to put things in. What format does it use for lat long? Decimal. Decimal? It's easy to convert decimal. Yeah, that's, that's easy. Or convert okay. from... So it's not the uh, hours, minutes, seconds? No, it, w it wants decimal. So, but like I say, it's not that tough to convert them. Go ahead, another question. To that question, how many decimal places does it record for each plus I want to say six, but you're at a level of accuracy that's kind of not necessary at six digits. Yeah, just, yeah, I'd go at least that. At least that. I set mine up. I just basically looked at what my GPS said, or uh, you can go out to like Google Earth, put the uh, crosshairs over your house, and get the lat longs from there. Okay. And it's and it'll be a decimal. I found an answer to the uh, logbook of the world multiple call signs. Okay. You have to request a separate PQSL for each call sign with a start and end date, and you have to request it separately. So it's like doing logbook of the world initial entry over again for each call sign. Uh, that does not surprise me. <laughs> does not surprise me at all. QRZ is kind of the same way. So it's, yeah, it's not a, not, not a knock. So, um, okay, now we're going to talk about um, importing your current logbook. So I, I know I'm running over time, but I want to answer questions. So I, I run the risk of going over 
but I get your questions answered versus let's ignore your questions and let's just pound through the presentation. I'd rather answer your questions. So if we're running over, I apologize, but I want to make sure that I answer your questions. It's worth every penny we pay. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to show you a short video. Hopefully this will work. Yes, this is a video where I'm importing my low, uh, uh, a file from my hard drive to QRZ. So I went over to settings. Now I'm going to come over here and select import. And then I'm going to choose file. This is a file on my local hard drive. I'm looking in my documents folder. Here's what this is. There's this file here that was created. I click on and click on import and it imports it. Select continue and I'm done. Hit refresh. So basically what I did is, um, and the, the question that you should ask is, well that little file that you uploaded, where did that come from? Well, in my case, um, what I did is I wrote a little program that will go out and it knows the last time I uploaded a QRZ from FT8. So it pulls all of the new calls that I've, all the new QSOs out of the FT8 log and drops them into my documents folder. And that's what I uploaded there. Now, how does that apply to you? Well, you might be using a, a program like Logbook or a, a, one of the many logging programs out there, and that might be how they do it. You go through and pick, I want to upload you know, these QSOs. It generates a file, drops it out there on your hard drive. You go to QRZ, you import that into QRZ. Might, that might be a, scenario, a possible scenario. In a minute, I'm going to go through a scenario where we're actually going to import my whole FT8 log file into QRZ. So I'm going to show you how to actually do that. So anyhow, and by the way, these videos are embedded in the presentation and they will be available on the website. Um, so you can download this entire presentation with its references and speaker notes and the associated videos so you can watch this in the privacy of your home. Now here's another video. This is where I'm actually going to uh, uh, export my QRZ logbook. Now my, why would I want to do that? I'm setting up a, a new client-based logging program on my hard drive and I want to populate it with my QRZ logbook. Okay, That's one scenario. Um, or you just want a local copy of your logbook on your local hard drive just because, you know, who knows. Don't care, I'm just showing you how to do it. So here we go. So again, I go to my logbook. I click on settings. I come over here and I select export. Export. Export a diff file. Now, if you were going to send me your log, this is what you would do, okay? So all these export and import in a diff format? Yes. And this only works with the paid version? Yes. Okay. Now, you'll notice uh, you, there's this download link here. What will also happen is QRZ will send you an email with a link to where you can download that ADIF file. Okay, that's what you would send to me is that email. You just forward me that email, I take it from there. Uh, otherwise, you can just click on download and it'll download that ADIF file to your local hard drive and then you can do whatever it was you were gonna do with it. But it'll be an ADIF file. So it'll be in that format that I showed you early on in the presentation. So anyhow, so there's, you can see how simple this all is. It, it, it is really quite simple. Okay, now I'm going to show you how 
I imported my entire FTA log, okay, up to QRZ, all right? So, you know, I've been going along using FTA for quite a while, <clears throat> learning how it worked, and I figured out where it puts its log file. So, you know, when you work somebody on FTA, if you set up, set up WSJTX, it'll come up and it'll show you, uh, you can either manually say, I want to log this, or it'll automatically throw up a screen and let you go ahead and log it by just clicking, you know, clicking on the button. And it'll log it. So it writes it to uh, at the, the WSJTX uh, log file, okay? And, it, and that file continues to grow, 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 grow. So then I said, well, I want to upload those to QRZ, and I don't want to hand type them in. That would be crazy. So here's how you do it. So again, go to logbook. Go to settings. Import. Now here's where you have to pay attention. Choose file. Okay, so now I'm going out to my C drive and users and my login directory, which is emorgan.000, uh, app data, local. The path is getting really long here, I know. I wrote it down for you. <laughs> so, and there's the log file right there. And so I'm selecting that file, saying, okay, I want to upload that. And there are 1,500 calls in there. And import my ADIF file. <coughs> now, I ended the video. I didn't actually want to upload that again because I'd already done it quite a while ago. But I wanted to take you completely through the process. So right here, after I clicked up, would click on that button, you get that little thing that comes up and it shows it being uploaded. And then all of your FT8 contacts would be uploaded to QRZ and, and it works really slick. Now, as long as your, um, your, your um, FT8 log is fairly small, you can go ahead and just keep uploading the same log as you add to it. But, and it'll handle the duplicates just fine. But after a while, you may want to just only upload and upload the deltas. And that's where that little program that I wrote uh, takes care of that for me automatically. It uploads just the deltas for me, creates that little file, drops it in my documents folder, and then I upload that. I will make that file available, that little program available <coughs> to all of you that are running Windows. If you're running Unix I'm sorry, or Linux, I'm, I can't help you. So, anyhow, so there you go. There's that. And Val, I can send that to you and we can put it up on the website if you want it. It's just, it's a really small little utility. There's no user interface, there's no configuration. Uh, you just put it somewhere on your hard drive and double click it. It knows where to find everything and handles it from there. Go ahead. Comment that ADIF file is, uh, or the app data file, excuse me, is hidden by default. You might want to go show how people can unpipe it. Um, yeah, you'd have, yeah, it's, uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I, I did publish the path to it in this. So here you can see, here's the full path to where my WSJTX log file is. Note that if you use um, FT4 or Whisper, it uses a different log file. It's in the same place, it's just the log file name is different, okay? Um, so anyhow, but yeah, it's in C colon backslash users, my login name, app data, local, WSJT-X, and then the log file name. Here in yours, it'll be, instead of my name, it'll be your name, whatever your <coughs> login name is. So that's where that, that uh, FT8 log file is located. If you just go into WSJTX, 
and go up there, there is a open log file. Right. And you can open up, it'll give you the location just like the file explorer. Just right. Copy and paste it, you don't know where it's at. Right. However, that does not work if you need to tell QRZ where that file's at. So, but yeah, what, he, what he's saying is that if you go into WSJTX and say open and click on open the log directory, that'll show, that's basically this folder right here. So, there's a lot of other, that's where your all.txt file is at and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, uh, setting up logbook of the world to talk to QRZ. I'm not going to demonstrate that here, but it, again, it is pretty straightforward. It's not that hard. Remember that folder I told you that you needed to know where it was at that had the TQSL stuff in it? Remember, remember I mentioned that? Well, you will need to know that when you go through this process here. And this quick start guide that I'm referencing here, very well done. Step by step shows you how to do it. It's really simple. But you need to know where you put your TQSL files at, okay? That's, that's what trips everybody up is because they haven't got a clue where that folder's at. That's why I tell you, you need to know where that folder's at. Uh, okay, uploading QRZ logbook entries. Oh, to logbook of the world. Okay, so here, so let's say I get on and I do FT8, have an FT8 session or CW session or a single side bench session, and I've, and I've loaded all of those QSOs into QRZ. So they're all here now, okay? And I want to sync up logbook of the world or my QRZ with logbook of the world. That's what we're going to do here. I'm going to sync up. So I went through that process of configuring my QRZ logbook to talk to logbook of the world. Okay, That was what that previous screen was, the getting started guide. Tells you how to do it. Really easy. So now I'm going to sync up QRZ with logbook of the world. So, I click on these little boxes and select all the QSOs that I want to upload to Logbook of the World. Go down here to Action, click on Send Selected Records to Logbook of the World, click on Continue, and that's it. It's that easy. Now, I'm set up so I can upload without putting in a password. Uh, so, but if, if you set yours up where you need a password in order to upload, then it'll ask you for that password. So, but I set mine up so I don't need a password to upload. So you will need the password to download, though, which I, I think I show that as well. So anyhow, so now all of those entries I upload, now usually what this looks like in real life is I'll have all of these new QSOs, they won't have this green background. They'll just be a white background. Those are the ones that I go in and select. I just, you know, just select those that don't have a green background. And then I go ahead and go through that process and upload those to Logbook of the World. Go ahead, Mel. You only do that upload once for the ones that don't have the green background, or do you do it more than once? Uh, the short answer, do I do it more than once for the ones that have already been uploaded to Logbook of the World? If something changes, which almost never does, then I will re-upload it. So, and the only time that something changes is I'll go in and record that I've gotten a paper QSL from that station. I will re-upload that to QRZ. So, um, I, yeah, I, other, otherwise, no, I don't re-upload them. Now, if I had to go in and change something here, then I, then I would re-upload it. So, um, okay, let's do the next one. Okay, this is importing from Logbook of the World. So now, let's say that there's a bunch of hams out there that I've talked to that don't use QRs at all. 
Okay, they use strictly logbook of the world. Okay, uh, and you'll run into people who are like that. They just kind of look down on anybody that uses QRZ. Um, but I want to go ahead and I want to bring all of those confirmations down or all those QSOs down from from logbook of the world. So here's how you do it. So I go over here to settings again. I come down here and say import. I put in my password. I double check to make sure that it says import new and or updated records and click on import from LOTW and you see this dialog and then it tells me and I had one new confirmation and I select, selected show I wanted to see who it was and it was a ZL4YL I'm sure many of you have worked her she's a real popular station so <laughs> anyhow so that that's all it takes to download to sync up your logbook of the world uh, QSOs into QRZ now some of the programs like Ham Radio Deluxe, log, Logbook for Old Men, and some of the others will automatically upload QSOs directly to Logbook of the World. Okay? That's built into the way they work. So this whole manual process I went through, or if you don't want to use QRZ at all, which I would not recommend if you want to improve your confirmation ratio, um, yeah, it's all, it, you can set up those programs to do this all for you. So very simple. So that's why I say, look, if you're looking at a client-based logbook, uh, check that would be a cool feature to have. Go ahead, Elliot. So when you, when you use something like HRD as the example you gave, you pay for that, but you don't have to pay the subscriptions to the other services because HRD will do it for you. Uh, if you want to download then you need to pay a subscription fee. But I, I could be wrong here. If you look up calls, use the call lookup feature, I think that you also would need the paid subscription fee. Or you're, at the very minimum, I think you're limited to how many you can download. Six a day. Uh, is it six a day is all you, you can look, look up? Six calls a day if you're not subscribed. If you don't subscribe. But, and HRV goes out to QRZ, or you can configure it to go out to QRZ to look up a call. So let's say you hear someone call in CQ, and you wonder who they are, where they are. So you go to, so you go into uh, HRD, type in their call sign. HRD goes up to QRZ, pulls their data down, and shows it to you. Okay, but those six lookups is that the same limit? To, to HRD or does the subscription fee for HRD take, take No, the subscription out? fee for HRD does not have any impact on QRZ. QRZ is so a separate. So you have to pay the subscription fee for lookups to each of those services. Yes. Walk with the world, QRZ. Yes. Now do you kind of see why I just decided to go with QRZ and not mess around with the others? Okay. I, why well, have two when one will do? You know, kind of that, that kind of thought process. And I again, I apologize. My bias is showing. I recognize it. Um, so, we are at the last slide of the deck, and I will entertain any other questions that I didn't already answer. Go ahead. Is there a way? Spreadsheet yes. to an ADF. Yes, send it to me. I'll take care of it for you. Uh, the Excel is <coughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah, just send me the raw spreadsheet. I'm a retired Microsoft guy, so I'm, 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 I'm good with all of the all the Microsoft software. Okay. So yeah, just send me the Excel. <coughs> my uh, information is up on QRZ, yeah. so you can okay. call my email address. <coughs> and right. I'll be happy. I wrote an algorithm that will do that. Okay. So, yeah, no problem. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, uh, if, if any of you have any other questions or need help sorting
recording on your area file or whatever, you know, let me know. I'm always happy to, to help. And I, I've been writing these conversion utilities for so many years. I'm pretty good at it. I probably already have one that will do the job. Go ahead, Mel. I use HRD, and another one I started using because all the DXers are using it is called DX Labs. It's yes. a freeware product. Yes. It's pretty good. Yep. But they, they're all good. And the hardest part is, like me, I started becoming a logging program collector. And I keep saying, should I use this one, or this one, or this one, or this one? <coughs> so it's best to find one you like, stay with it, and don't go away from it. Been there, done that, and ended up at QRZ, with QRZ. So, but I totally, totally get it. And I, yeah, I did. I, I did the HRV and uh, Lockbook for Old Men and several others. I don't know. HRV for me was like going jackrabbit hunting with a howitzer. <laughs> so I just kind of like, uh, my it, favorite way. it did so much stuff. I just, anyhow. Okay. Back to you. <laughs> so what it, what it all comes down to, I guess the same's dead. That works. Yeah, it looks like this thing might be dying here. Uh, what it all comes down to is, is what you would prefer to use. I know that, uh, what is it called? 1M, MM, or M1M? Yeah. M1, M1MM. It's, it's uh, pretty popular as far as that goes, and some of the other ones. Uh, it's For the contesters. Right, right. It depends on what you want to use, what you're using it for, how much you're willing to spend, that kind of thing. I was just thinking, instead of just writing all these other programs, why don't you just create something that allows people to put in something to an ADIF file, and then you just upload it wherever the heck you want? I actually already have. Okay, so there you go. Uh, probably the simplest thing in the world. It'll have just the entries you need, creates one single file, and you can do whatever you want with it. What it, what, it, what it actually does is it it brings up a screen, you type in a call sign, and it, it'll look at the ADIF file that it has, and if there's entries for that call sign in there, it'll display them all so you can see when you work that station, and then it asks you, do you want to log this station? And if you answer, oh, and it, and it does go up to QRZ as well and pulls that data down. And then if you want to log that station, you just so select that you want to log it. But you have to manually fill in the frequency, um, you know, the, the, it, it'll calculate the, the time, but you can overwrite the time if you want. Uh, and it'll convert the local time to GMT. It only works in the mountain time zone on daylight savings or not. So anyhow, so that program does exist. I just haven't made it available because I didn't think anybody would want it. Right. I, I was just saying that because, uh, well, I thought it would be funny. And then you said you had one, so that was even better. Um, there is one last thing. Uh, there is the seventh uh, call area QSO party that will be coming up. Uh, this will actually conflict with um, our Saturday operations up at... Uh, uh, Golden Spike. It's Saturday, Mar uh, May 6th. Um, however, there's nothing saying that we can't also do some of that while we're up there. <laughs> so, what it means is that KZ70 will not be joining us, that, that which correct. just broke my heart. <laughs> well, you could come up and do it up there. Yeah, Bob hey, Elder's not a hard to find county. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say this. You can do both because yes. the, the, the Golden Spike is only from 10 o'clock to 5. Come home and get on and do your county sure. in sure. the evening. Yeah, uh, so just, just be aware that that is coming up. It is, uh, it's the state QSO party. It's uh, uh, 44 states and three provinces have a QSO party. So this was just some information sent to me by, I think it's by the ARRL section somebody so uh, they just wanted to make sure that we knew that this was coming up um, and give you guys that information we'll make that information I'll send Val the, the paper that I was sent he can put that up on the website as well um, so are there any other thing any other business or anything for the club can I make a, just a little announcement okay uh, we're working very very hard on emergency communications in the whole area and basically Weaver County 
and uh, really want to invite everybody uh, to uh, check out our uh, our net on Thursday nights. We're going to have some information about where we're going with that and everything. We have actually managed. We're trying to grow from it. We've managed up in the uh, uh, bench area there where the fire was, just up above that, uh, uh, for the uh, Ogden Stake area. And we managed to have a rapid damage assessment exercise in conjunction with the city and county so that we can go out and actually do rapid damage assessment in the community. We can get that information back to the wards and states, back to the city and county so that they can dispatch resources because they're not going to have anybody in your community coming out and checking how things are. And so what we managed to do, unlike what happens all over the country, we managed to establish credibility with our information to the city and county where they will actually dispatch resources based on a report from us uh, in, in a structured way so that we know how they want that information. We just love to have everybody join it. Uh, it just helps us, helps everything in, in a big emergency. You know, we're going to have that big earthquake in those days. And you know, what's going to happen is going to be total chaos. So the better we can help with our hand uh, communications ability, the better. So join in. Uh, Ogdenstake.org, we have a website, just Ogdenstake.org, and there's an enormous amount of resources there. But join us on Thursday night at uh, 7.30 on uh, 14499. Okay, so uh, there's other things going on in the county with uh, emergency communications. Yeah. Uh, just when we're done, can I get Larry, Stan, and Kenny over here at the board real quick, just talk to them? About ham and eggs. Okay. And we're done. <laughs> That's fine. You can do whatever you want when we're done. <laughs> um, so if, if that's it, then uh, thank you, Gene. That was extremely uh, uh, informative. Um, thank you. I don't think I've ever heard uh, watering elephants in such uh, an interesting manner. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you for coming, and uh, we'll let you know. Please keep updated on everything. We'll let you know what's going on for next month's club meeting.